everyone, thank you again for joining us, us today. My name is Danielle and I'm a program manager here at Google. Before we get started, I wanna go over a couple of events that will be upcoming for Apache Beam. Um, just wanna remind you guys that the Beam College is starting this May 10th and we recommend um, that you guys sign up as early as possible. There will be free workshops to help improve your skills on data processing as we posted in the past. And I also wanna recommend you guys to also sign up and register for the Beam Summit that is gonna be hosted in Austin, Texas, this July 18th through the 20th. Right now we have an early bird special that will be ending soon. And our sessions are finally posted online so you can check those out. I wanna introduce you guys to Ning Kang. He's a software engineer here at Google. He's been very hands-on in the community for Beam and it's been awesome to see him you know, help out our community and partake in these events. We're very grateful to hear him speak today. Um, Ning has over seven years of experience in software engineer and also three years working on data pipelines. During today, there will be a chat form in the bottom below bottom right corner to discuss um, anything as we go. So feel free to use that to talk internally. Um, there's also a question form that says ask a question. Um, it's below your screen that you can use to ask some Q and A's for the end of our session. Um, feel free to add those as we go along. And then also at the end, we will have a review, which we ask and encourage you to fill out. Um, it'll auto generate once we finish our session and the conversation will be uploaded to YouTube. So you can go there to check out the session if you hadn't been able to see the entire time or if you wanna showcase it with your friends. Um, there'll also be a follow-up discussion on our Slack channel. So again, thank you Ning for joining us. I'll give you the floor. Um, he's going to be just discussing using Apache Beam with Numba on GPUs. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me. Um, hi, uh, I'm Ning. Uh, today I'm going to give a talk about uh, using Beam with Numba on GPUs. Um, uh, we will have a live demo uh, after we go through some of the slides. So uh, one of the questions we want to ask to ourselves before we discuss everything is like, why do we want to use GPUs? So uh, the GPUs allow you to accelerate some tasks because um, for some of the uh, computations, uh, GPUs can perform faster than CPUs. Uh, they're usually numerical linear algebra. Um, such as the things that you see in, uh, in computer vision and like a ML use case, uh, other ML use cases. Uh, and the extent of performance improvement um, actually varies. So it doesn't really mean that if you use GPU, your, uh, your processing tasks will be executed faster. Um, it all depends on the type of the computation and the amount of data processed. So uh, there's a graph uh, comparing CPU and GPU. So GPU has uh, a lot more throughput and it can execute tasks uh, with more uh, parallelism than CPUs, uh, uh, even though they have like relatively lower frequency. So um, how do you use Apache Beam with GPUs? So one of the things that we have uh, uh, with uh, Google Cloud is that we have a Beam notebooks that allows you to develop and productionize your pipelines with GPUs. Uh, normally, if you want to run a Beam pipeline with GPUs, you have to do some, uh, it doesn't really uh, need to be Beam, it can be anything else. Like uh, you have to have a environment that supports GPU and uh, the GPU should be able to support some kind of uh, computing framework such as CUDA. And option, optionally, um, you can use libraries that implicitly use GPUs. So you don't have to work directly with GPUs. Uh, for example, if you use uh, TensorFlow, it's like uh, like that. You you can use some higher level APIs to uh, do the computation and let those libraries handle the interaction with GPUs. Um, to run Beam pipelines on Dataflow, um, additionally, you have to use some kind of custom containers, and not necessarily, but uh, most of the time you have to use a custom container to configure your uh, drivers, configure your uh, dependencies, so there are some details that you can see from this link. And also like for other OSS runners, um, with the possibility of Beam, you can actually run Beam pipelines on other runners such as Flink and Spark. So there are also support on GPU accelerated uh, things on Apache Flink and Apache Spark. So uh, for today's live demo, we're going to use Beam Notebooks because um, it's a, uh, service that hosts notebook VMs pre-installed with the latest data science and machine learning framework. So actually we are going to get, what we're we going to get is uh, having a notebook runtime with dependencies that allows us to uh, execute code on GPUs. 
and introspect the readouts. So now, so we are going to use a JIT compiler called Namba. So Namba is an open source JIT compiler that translates a subset of Python and NumPy code into faster machine code. So it is designed to be used with NumPy arrays and functions. It works great with distributed notebooks. Uh, it, it helps parallelize your algorithm for CPUs and GPUs. So it can uh, compile your coding to things that can be run on a CUDA supported GPU. Uh, so why we use this composition? Uh, uh, because um, first we want to use uh, the scalability of Beam. So you can distribute your work to more than one GPU, not just the GPU on one of the machine that you have. And uh, when you use notebooks, you can uh, minimize your setup. So you don't have to uh, first install your driver or install those dependencies, set up container. Um, you can just develop and run code locally on a GPU and then later run it on things like Dataflow with more GPUs. And uh, with Numba, it's more implicit and generic. So the code you is where you use the GPUs. You can execute very generic and primitive tasks. Um, I like some higher level libraries that you're, you're at. you can do uh, simple things with it uh, if you don't want to use many of the, oh yeah, I'm going to publish a link for the top one. Thank you. Um, so also uh, to be explicit and generic, um, it gives you a capability to know which piece of code is executed on GPU, which is, uh, a machine code that runs on CPU or which are native Python code. Uh, let's see. And you know which data is on host and which is on device. And you, you have to explicitly copy the data run. And with Notebook, you can view what each GPU thread does. Uh, we'll see that in the lab demo. Um, so first we want to go through some of the basics of GPUs, how GPUs work or how CUDA works. The CUDA is uh, short for Computer Unified Device Architecture. It's a parallel computing platform and application program interface uh, that allows you, software to use certain type of graphics processing units for general purpose processing. Uh, so uh, the, ex the explanation in the following slides are very uh, oversimplified. Uh, they're just a very basic for you to understand what we are going to do in the lab demo. Um, so let's go through some of the terms. Um, so with CUDA, you have a kernel. A kernel is a function that runs on GPU. It doesn't return, but um, write to an array passed in. And you have grid, thread, block, and thread. So they are uh, like basically the hierarchy of threads for a kernel to call the kernel in parallel. So the, the, those threads invoke the kernel in parallel, runs those, uh, runs those kernel function. And you have you have host and device that basically just CPU, GPU, or resources that are accessible by CPU and GPU. Um, with this graph, we can see uh, you have a grid. Inside the grid, you have a like this is a 2D blocks, and inside each block, you have like 2D uh, threads. And then when you execute your uh, software, you you have your serial code. You can only execute on CPU, and then if uh, for your code that is parallelized, that can be executed on the GPU, it's executed on this grid. So your your kernel is, is, is executed by all these threads in parallel on this grid. And then if you run into serial code, you, you re return to your CPU to continue execution, and then you have parallelized code that runs on grid, and then you run them here. You have multiple grids. Uh, next would be uh, in terms of Numba. So Numba is a uh, Python library. So to use all those terminologies and you, you write them into real code, it will actually look like this. So if you have input of like one D array of elements, uh, you can write a kernel like this, this kernel function. Uh, you use a special CUDA.jit decorator to decorate this function so that it can be jitted to a binary that can be executed on CUDA. And uh, there, this is the one convention basically just telling you 
uh, what's the position of this thread, the current thread. So you say CUDA.grid1, give you the current position uh, on the thread, uh, of the thread, and then you compare the thread, uh, the position with your, uh, your, with your array on device. I'm sure this is terrible. With your array on device size. So if it's within the range, you actually, you can do something to the input and put it in, uh, back as the output. So this is an array on device. So how do you invoke this kernel? You first copy your array on host to the device. So you can use CUDA.toDevice, copy an array from your host, CPU, and to device that would be on GPU. And then you can specify how many threads per block you want to use. So like, for example, I say 100. And then I want to decide how many blocks per grid I want to use. I can say just uh, array size divided by uh, threads per block. And to invoke the kernel, I put two things, blocks per grid and threads per grid here uh, with this square bracket. And then I invoke it with uh, actually array on device. Uh, there should be a rare on device. And once this kernel is invoked, you copy your uh, array on device back to your host. That's how your CPU can continue uh, the execution for your things like uh, serial code that are not parallelized and are not executed on GPU. So we can do a live demo. Sure, this tabbing state, make it bigger. Um, can you see this? Uh, does this um, look the right size to you? Yes, it looks good. Okay, yeah, then I'll continue. So uh, we're running an example notebook that uh, uses Monte Carlo method to calculate pi. So um, uh, a simple explanation of this is like a, you, you can use Monte Carlo method to uh, approximate the value of pi. This is just run a uh, random number and see how many of them uh, actually falls into a circle. Like, and then you uh, use the probability of like this random points that fall into a circle to actually calculate the pi. So. That's what we're going to do in this example. And uh, we're going to demonstrate uh, uh, the computation at the same scale, but uh, of simple size, but on different runtimes. And uh, let's see, so first we can install Numba. So I already installed Numba here, so I don't really need to restart the notebook or no, but yeah. And also check if uh, we have a uh, CUDA libraries available. So CUDA libraries are already available. We can uh, set our logging level to error. So we just ignore some of the warnings on the way. And then let's see. So we want to uh, compute the multi color pi. And uh, this is uh, one of the function that we can say uh, use. This is native Python code. Uh, if you run this function with a sample size, you can actually calculate pi. You just run and generate some of the random numbers uh, within uh, one, and and you uh, use this to see uh, if it's within the circle. And if it's within the circle, you accumulate the count of random points that falling into the circle, and then you divide that by your sample size and time it to four because you only have uh, a quarter of a circle if you generate random numbers uh, in uh, zero to one. So, um, and then we we are going to cheat that into machine code. So uh, if we say uh, we use from number import cheat to import this decorator, and then we can use this parameter to say, uh, we don't want the Python implementation. We want to, you to use uh, things as low level as possible. And this is still the same function, right? These two functions are exactly the same. It's just this one has a decorator. This one doesn't have a decorator. So we compile this. Uh, 
and we define a sample size like 100 million. We want to generate 100 million um, random numbers. And we can say, uh, we can just run this Python code to count approximate pi. And we are timing it by uh, setting a start timer. And uh, it should take a pretty long time to actually generate a 100 million uh, random number like in sequence and execute it on Python. So just wait for a second. I think it should take a, about like 40 seconds for this uh, notebook instance. Yeah. So the it calculates pi as three dot one four one four five six two four uh, in thirty nine seconds. Then we can actually run the machine code. Uh, we can do a time for the first run, and uh, during the first run, it should be uh, compile this to machine code because it's JIT, so it it doesn't really compile everything before head. So it only compiles this code to machine code when it's ex uh, executed for the first time. And also then we're going to use a magic called time it to actually run it in multiple loops and see how good the performance is averagely. So let's run it. So the Monte Carlo Pi is calculated as 3.1418, something like this. And that only take, uh, took 1.3 seconds comparing to the 39 seconds. <laughs> and when we run this thing multiple times after the first execution, you can see every time it takes about uh, 900 milliseconds. So that's even a little bit uh, shorter than one second. So we had seven run. Uh, we had seven runs, one loop each, and uh, the average is like 900 milliseconds. So that's comparatively much faster than Python code. But with Numba, you don't really need to change your code. It's the same code. You just put a decorator here. Now it runs like 40 times faster. And then we can try to. Uh, Modify the code to adapt to a GPU, a CUDA setup. So for this one, we cannot use uh, the normal random generator. We are going to use this thing called create XOR Shiro 122 at 8P states and this thing to generate the random numbers. And we are going also to use a different decorator called CUDA and a different decorator called NGIT. And we're going to use um, NumPy to like function as the uh, structure to contain our inputs and outputs. Um, so let's execute this one. So what it does is we split that function we just had into two parts. One is we we use an array to store uh, how many random numbers actually, like we, we consider them falling into the circle and we accumulate them and uh, output them. Then we do a calculated pi that doesn't really need to run on a GPU. Yes. It's just one calculation. We, we can just run it on CPU. Um, and also we using NGIT because we are uh, doing calculation against NumPy array. Uh, for CUDA JIT, we are using the idiom that we just uh, explained in the slide where we are getting the position of each thread. This is actually, this actually functions as a kernel function. So this is a kernel. Um, we get the position of each thread and for each thread inside of it, we have a sub sample size. So everything here is still executed serially uh, in sequence, like, but they are like executed on GPU but each kernel can be executed in parallel on GPU threads. So, and we have uh, more than one input. We have an R random number generator state as input. We have a sub sample size. So we are going to divide that 100 million 
sample size in uh, based on how many GPUs RAID we're going to use. Then we define that we are going to use RAID per blocks as 64 and blocks as 80. And we create a NumPy array, uh, NumPy array uh, with the D type as flow 32 and uh, using the thread numbers as the uh, array size. So this will be a NumPy array that is currently on host. Then we copy that to device and we create a random number generator state using a seed of one. And then we divide the uh, total sample size of 100 million uh, by how many threads we are going to have. And that, that becomes a simple sub-sample size for each GPU thread. We define the kernel. We define what we are going to do against the output of the kernel execution. And we define how we got, we're going to invoke the kernel. Uh, we can see the performance when running everything on GPU. So the first run took 0 0.5 seconds to run the same computation on GPU. So that's even faster than, than running a machine code. Right. And then we time it. Yeah, that's that's about right. Yeah. We're going to use ng4 uh, the lines with numpy function. And you can see, um, because this is still uh, JIT, even though it's running on CUDA, uh, it's CUDA JIT. So the, for the following runs, since this thing is already compiled, um, as we can see, each run only takes like five milliseconds compared to machine code that runs for 900 milliseconds. So that's even faster. So for this kind of computation that uh, we can parallelize and most of the calculation, uh, a GPU actually works so much faster than CPU. And then we are going to introduce beam into the picture. So uh, we just use a number to JIT some of the functions and run them. Now we want to say why we want to use beam uh, is because we want to uh, be able to distribute that into multiple workers with multiple GPUs. So how do we create a pipeline and also use uh, apply the JIT to your like transform scale, uh, your user defined functions. So we do some import here, create a pipeline option that we want, we're going to use some uh, direct runner. We're going to use the impact runner, but without anything, it's going to use, just use the direct runner and it runs everything on this VM instance. Uh, we are specifying direct number of workers to zero so that you can default to threads a process of the number of the cores on this machine. And we're defining the direct running mode to be multi-threading. And then we create a do fun. We actually call it sampler. Um, for this do fun, it has uh, two parameters that you can tune to decide how many threads you're going to use. And then you can uh, inside your setup, you can do create a array on the host and inside the process, which is basically the main body of the do form, you do some imports and create a kernel function here. The kernel function would be still be the same function that we just had. Um, and the way you invoke the function is still the same. Uh, it's just that, that in the end of the transform, we are actually copying the output to the host. So you're a, you're yielding a NumPy array in the end. And also for this element, we know that we are going to use a tuple of int and int. Because NumPy needs to be nested in that process method in order to work. Um, so this doesn't necessarily apply to NumPy. It can be any, uh, it can be any libraries that you're going to use. So for this notebook, you, if you run everything locally, it doesn't really need to be inside a do farm. 
But if you later want to write on Dataflow, you have to figure out a way to stage your dependencies to Dataflow. So uh, to avoid like name error. So if you're putting input here, uh, it's one way to avoid uh, name error so that when you stage your job to Dataflow, it actually knows they need to like stage these imports. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, that's a kernel. That's the way to invoke kernel. And we are yielding the output back to the host in this transform. Did we execute this yet? We haven't. So we define this do form. So we're dividing the work to 100 samplers. And uh, in a distributed environment, each sampler can run a different machine with its own GPU. And we're going to have like 5,000 threads. On the Python GPU, and we have 100 samples running concurrently, executed by being on our CPU cores. So we can do that. Um, so let's run everything locally and see what we happen. Uh, so we are creating a 100 a, a initial collection that's basically a sample size per sampler that. That uh, will be a, basically a constant of defining, uh, depending on how many sampler we are going to create. We say we have one in 100 sampler, then based on the 100 million uh, sample size, we want each sampler to sample 1 million random numbers. And then we use uh, a range of sampler count as a seed for our random numbers so that we don't generate the same sequence of random numbers again and again. So each sampler uses a different seed for the random number. And the input is a tuple, seed, and the size to sample. And then when we apply that initial value, the initial peak collection, to the part two of samplers. So if we execute this, it's doing those 100 million sampling of random number and deciding how many of them falls into a circle. And uh, the collect, we we'll collect how many uh, numbers are actually falling in, into the circle. So we have 5,000 thread, five, not 5,000, but 5,120 threads. 5,120 thread starts with zero. And we have 100 samplers. It shows them now has a number. The number would be how many points, like of the sub sample uh, that actually falls into the uh, circle. So you can see what the output is for like each of the thread on GPU after the execution. And then we are going to uh, aggregate the values and just calculate the uh, the pi value. So we can define a function called MP sum. So this is, is also a way to work around the name error in case we are going to run it on Dataflow or some, somewhere remotely. We define a function. We do the import. We nest it inside that function. And then when we apply the function to the samplers per GPU, we're actually just summing them up. And we are going to give the output type as int. So it's not a NumPy type anymore. And then we are going to see uh, the accumulated number per sampler instead of like a accumulated number per sampler per GPU thread. So if we do this, we can see that we have 100 samplers and each of them now have their um, a community number uh, aggregated. And then we can combine everything globally. We'll have a single number that contains like the uh, aggregated value of all the accumulated value from each of the samplers. And then we just calculate pi. And we can see uh, the public graph, what it looks like. You create something. That's the seed and the sub sample size. We apply a do form. We do a map. And we 
we do a map that basically is summing everything for each GPU thread. We will, this is a, excuse me, on CPU here. This part is on GPU. And then this part is on CPU that we combine everything globally. And then this thing is on CPU that we just calculate a single value. So we want to do the performance of being pipeline locally on uh, GPU. Let's just run it. So the recordings.clearp that actually clears the cache of the, for the pipeline. So we don't have like a force high performance estimation. Everything is re-executed. So it took like 15 seconds to calculate the pipe. Um, this also includes the time to uh, cheat your code. So if you run this, if you run this pipeline in a similar setup, it will actually run faster if you run it locally. But since you're eventually you're going to run it on uh, a remote setup, every job would be distinct. So um, the the JIT only helps if you have if you sequentially call something uh, multiple times later, but otherwise like the performance is basically like this. So you, it took about 15 seconds. It, it has some overhead uh, with Beam and with uh, your CPU code other than your sampling, but this, the sampling only took a while. So this is already a speed up. This is definitely uh, faster than a normal Python code that's running on locally on the CPU, even though we overhead of building a pipeline and executing it. And then we can do a uh, running the same pipeline on Dataflow with GPU. Um, to use other OSS runners, you, you probably need to follow the instructions uh, on those runners uh, development guide. So here we are just uh, doing it on Dataflow. Um, so first check your uh, Python version. So we are having 3.7 in this VM instance. So we know that we are using Python 3.7. Um, and when we're running on Dataflow, we are going to use the NVIDIA Tesla T4 GPU. And we can select the Beam SDK ver uh, version. Uh, we use 2.33 in this example. Uh, this example was uh, quite old. It has some time, yeah. And then we are going to um, build a customer container. So first we want to check some of the cloud services that we uh, and see if we have already enabled them. So check we have IAM service enabled so that we can now uh, check the IAM policy and see if we, um, have every, everything configured correctly. And uh, if we have the capability to create containers and uh, store it on cloud, uh, if we have the capability to build containers on cloud, and then we configure our, uh, uh, configure the Docker. So we don't really, we are not really building a container on this VM instance. So this, v, uh, this notebook instance is also a VM. Um, you can consider it as a Linux machine. You can run, you, you do can run Docker command on this, but it's not recommended to build your Docker containers on this notebook instance itself. You might run into all kinds of issues if you try to do that. <laughs> and also like the thing that you build, it might not be consistent. So uh, using a cloud build to build a con uh, container is a better approach. So we have those executed, then we create a directory somewhere under the home Jupyter directory, We're just creating a directory so that uh, we can write a Docker file. So uh, to write a Docker file uh, to work with Beam and uh, NVIDIA CUDA, you can just uh, use the NVIDIA provided uh, CUDA container. And you can find uh, the base images from here. For example, if you if you go to Nvidia's NGC, you can actually search for all kinds of uh, container images. And come back to the demo. So the the one we are going to use, we are going to use CUDA 11.0.3 Devo and uh, Ubuntu 20.04. So, yeah, 
And then we are going to, uh, there, there could be some TZ data handling the Docker build. So you uh, use this to disable that. And then you install a bunch of things, install Python, install um, Apache Beam, install Numba, NumPy, Pandas, things like that. And you do a pip check on this like base image. And then you copy your uh, Python SDK to, uh, to one of the directory and set it as an entry point of this Docker image. So this is just an example of a Docker file. Depending on um, depending on later what the version of CUDA your worker is going to use, what Python version that you're using, what Beam SDK you're using, you are going to write this uh, Docker file differently. So once you have the Docker file ready, you can actually do a cloud build. You can do everything from within a notebook. You don't have to jump around in different places. So you get the project, you say gcloud build, submit, tag, tag this thing as this thing, and then you do a timeout of 20 minutes. So um, under that directory where you have the Docker file, it actually knows how to stage the cloud build task and then actually build a container and stores it to your project's container registry. Uh, we've, this will take a long time. So I will not run it again here. Uh, we already have a uh, container previewed. So if we say gcloud container images list and grip the CC GPU, uh, we can see one of the containers that we are actually going to use is already there. Uh, you don't have to download it to the VM instance. You can just use it. So uh, with this setup, just saying we do some uh, additional imports for data flow. We configure our GCS bucket, configure our project. If you, if you do it like this, it actually knows what project this is. So because this VM instance is also running inside a project. And then we are going to append one more transform. We write that result of our calculated pi to a text file on Google Cloud Storage using the GCS bucket. And we create a new a uh, pipeline options uh, with some staging location, temp location. And we're going to use our SDK container image. That is the CC underscore GPU container image we just created. And we are going to use the machine type as M1 standard four uh, with disk size of 50 gigabyte to use uh, GPU on data flow. You have to use an experiment called worker accelerator. And you put the type of the accelerator, you put the number of accelerator, and you ask it to install a media driver. So that's one single experiment that looks like this. And you can also add an experiment to use runner v2. Uh, I think that's already default. So once you have these options created, uh, you come here to run your pipeline. So this pipeline is uh, the pipeline just executed locally on this VM instance. Uh, now you can just say, I create a data flow runner. I want to run the pipeline with the new option that I just created. And yeah, so let's just run it. So once the pipeline needs, once it, this job is sent to data flow, you get a link. Actually, it's output from here. You can get, you can create a link uh, using this kind of magic. And then this sale is waiting for the pipeline to execute. Uh, we can click here to see what the data flow job looks like. So share this tab. Uh, so this is a job we just created and we executed it on, uh, locally, but now we are actually staging it to data flow for execution. Uh, as you can see, each of the transform is pre-fixed uh, with a bracket and number that that's indicating uh, on which cell, notebook cell, the transform was applied, so 12, and indicate that uh, the creation was executed on 12. So if we go back to our example, we look for, 12. So this P collection, this transform was applied in cell 12. 
the 12, it creates the initial input. And then 13, we would do the map. And the particle sampler is also within 12. So this is a way for us to distinguish uh, transforms that are executed from different notebook cells so that when you apply transforms uh, again, again, if, you're, if you keep re-executing cells in notebook, it actually knows that those are different transforms. Otherwise, you, uh, Beam doesn't really allow you to create transforms with the same name again, again. So, so this is what we added. This was never executed locally. This is write your text. So what we're going to do, we are going to wait for the job to finish execution. And but since I've already executed this job uh, before the demo, we can actually check what the result looks like. So if you just go to your staging location and cat the result, hopefully this thing is still there. Um, yeah, hopefully the file is still there. Oh, uh, no. We have to wait for this to <laughs> complete because we are blocking the execution by the pipeline result wait until finish. Yeah, yeah, this would take a while. Uh, most of the time is not spent on execution the job. Uh, most of the time not spent like, most of the time is spent on like creating a worker pool, starting those workers, set up all the dependencies. Uh, the execution, especially the execution on a GPU only took a little bit of time uh, for the whole life of this pipeline. So, okay, let's just wait a few more seconds. As you can see, the samplers, uh, these are like my globally, these steps haven't begun yet. We are still waiting for the worker pool to set up. So based on the throughput, the auto scaling decide to just start one worker. And now we have one worker. Uh, it's, yeah, I should refresh this page. Yeah, it's still exit. Oh, I can actually share uh, some of the slides. Yeah, share this tab instead. So while we're waiting for the execution of the job, um, on this slide, there's a link to a copy of the notebook. You might not be able to uh, execute the notebook completely if you don't have like in all this enough uh, setup. If you didn't use like the notebooks, if you use a your own notebook setup, you have to make sure that you have a GPU. Uh, maybe you have Docker, you have a cloud project with necessary APIs enabled and resources to run everything. And we have some snapshots. Uh, for the demo in case uh, you want to like review what happened, but you cannot execute everything. Um, so you can expect local run results on GPS threads. You can build a custom container for running on data flow just directly from your notebook. Uh, you can run a data flow job and write the result to a file. And then you can just throw the result running uh, on data flow because the result is not written to a file. You can just view the content in that file. And we have several useful links. For example, the, the example in the book, the link to Beam Notebooks, a five minute guide to number. And the graphs in CUDA C++ programming guide is actually pretty helpful. Um, it helps you understand uh, how CUDA, like how CUDA works uh, in design. You don't necessarily need to write C++ code. Uh, and we, we also have a link for data flow support on GPUs. And yeah, let's just wait for the execution. In the meantime, if you have questions, please feel free to ask.